media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks, his website, RickAckerman.com. Welcome back to the show, Rick. Always a pleasure, Jim. I appreciate your inviting me on. Rick, uh, taking a look at a market that just continually goes higher, sets record highs, it appears almost every week, uh, do you have confidence in it? Yeah, I have confidence we're in a topping process. And uh, the, the difficult thing is that everybody thinks that, you know, even the bulls are, are, are at the point of realizing this market is just a little too crazy and there's really nothing supporting it other than than stimulus dollars. So, uh, um, so I think I, I did a piece in my own newsletter a few weeks ago. You can access it just by going to rickackerman.com in the lower left hand corner. There's a, a bunch of essays, my last four, five or six of them. But one of them looked at IBM from 2009 and, and asked the question, how are tops formed when everybody knows that a top is coming? And IBM offers a good example. And since I put that piece out, uh, things at least so far have have borne borne out what I what I wrote, namely that uh, when we had that top at Labor Day and so many of my colleagues nailed it right on the button, uh, we, we were all kind of patting ourselves and each other on the back. But uh, I think uh, I I for one was looking over my shoulder, uh, even though you could say, oh, that's it for the bull. Uh, what happens is you see a little short squeeze rally. And everybody reads the short squeeze rally as kind of a, a, a nothing burger, but and it is. But you get a few consecutive short squeezes, and pretty soon you're talking about a real rally. And then at some point, which happened a couple weeks ago, the market finally gets eyes for the old highs, and that's that's where we are. We're trading above the old highs. So, so I, I do think we're at a top, but it's going to be a very tricky and difficult and elongated one because everybody is fully expecting it when you're in a position like that do you just sit back uh and not invest in anything no i think you got to get ready because uh, we're going to have uh some dramatic changes in our way of life when this bear market finally gets rolling nothing will be the same and uh, all the systems the pension systems for one uh that have been uh held at, 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 at certain heights, they're all going to come down. You know, we're going to have a, see a pension collapse and a lot of other things are going to happen. So I don't think you want to sit idly by. And uh, you and I have talked about something my good friend Doug Bainfield calls the barbell strategy, which uh, puts a, a good chunk of your nest egg into uh, the things that nobody wants right now, namely gold and, and treasuries. So that's where I think you should you should be. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your outlook for not just big cities but suburban life? Well, <clears throat> we were talking just briefly before uh, the interview about a book I'm reading by James Kunstler. Kunstler is uh, a brilliant observer of pretty much anything he's observing. And uh, the book was called uh, Too Much Magic. And it was written in 2012. Uh, too much magic being our misplaced faith in technology to solve all problems. And uh, at the time, he was writing, the, his whole thesis came from the idea that we were at peak oil. So he didn't have a chance to see the amazing impact that fracking has had on energy supplies, essentially postponing the disaster that he saw arising out of, out of uh, energy becoming more scarce. So in, in, in 
It, it will be. You know, fracking, I think, has given us a, a temporary relief, but we're going to reach the point where cities themselves become obsolete. Um, as uh, the, you can see it coming, it, the pandemic accelerated the process in ways that that uh, Kunstler could not see. But uh, he mentions someone up on the 68th floor of a New York skyscraper coming down to ground level to grab a sandwich. And it's exactly that kind of energy that we don't have the resources uh, to, we don't have infinite supply to make that possible forever. So he also characterizes the suburbs as the hugest uh, misallocation of capital in the history of mankind. And uh, he sees the suburbs as kind of a wasteland. They work because uh, in an energy-rich economy, people can drive 40 or 50 miles uh, to get into the city to come to their jobs and, and then go home at the end of the day, or they can even take a train, which, of course, uses its own power, albeit more efficiently. So he sees the suburbs essentially as, uh, as dead zones. And um, the irony being, and again, Kunstler wasn't writing at a time when he could foresee this, but the pandemic flight to the suburbs has pushed um, real estate there to even more uh, astronomical levels. So if the suburbs were a huge waste then, they're a big bubble waste now. And um, I, I, it's predictable that when the bear market comes ushering in the third Great Depression, um, we're going to see that all these jobs that you can supposedly stay home and do add nothing to the economy. They add so little value. Uh, <clears throat> they're all part of the information age, uh, which has, uh, in my mind, very questionable value. In a situation like that, then, how do you prepare for it? Bonds and gold. And, and uh, well, you know what, to get to give Kunstler a little, uh, to go a little bit deeper into that, he said that the cities will uh, kind of, that are best organized around the way old cities worked, which was a collection of neighborhoods where you could kind of walk from one neighborhood to the other, and pretty much everything you needed was within close proximity. And as you translate that to the, uh, the suburbs and the exurbs, the most critical need will be for food. So the, the, the suburbs that will be able to survive uh, will be the ones that are near their own, their, their source of food. So I, I take a look at a place where I live, New Westminster, which is a suburb of Vancouver. It's a small city, 70,000 people. And if you don't mind hills, you can walk the entire place. And uh, where I live again, uh, you know, major uh, food stores and so on are all within walking distance. Is, is that something? And even Vancouver itself, they're trying to make a city where you can walk and bicycle everywhere uh, with ease. And so it's built around little communities. And uh, are those the cities of the future? <clears throat> Uh, not necessarily, hmm. because as I mentioned, food is really the critical thing. And um, you can see when you go into the, the bigger stores, uh, a lot of them don't have uh, locally supplied foods uh, and groceries. And we're only we're in a trend, I guess. Uh, the the uh, restaurants have gone toward locally grown, and that's been a big selling point, at least pre-pandemic. But um, but as you can appreciate, when you get uh, certain fruits flown in from New Zealand and and tomatoes from Mexico, whatever. It's all very energy intensive. And again, going back to Kunstler's theory, uh, we're not going to have unlimited energy resources to make it possible to supply uh, all these uh, grocery stores other than locally. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a cousin of mine invented a, a system in England where they use shipping containers where you grow uh, vegetables at the top of the container, or I should say fish in tanks, and then their waste is used to fertilize vegetables that are grown in other tanks that are in the shipping container, and then you can stack them up behind your grocery store or your restaurant. She won, I think, uh, some kind of a royal award for this innovation. Is that the future of food production on our planet? Just have them in local containers, and if we have unused office space downtown, why not turn those into vertical farms? 
Now, he's really down on that. Even the vertical farms require uh, energy for, you You know, like marijuana growers know all about that. You need light. And uh, he's, he's not very big on the little plots of uh, urban, the urban landscape. Uh, my brother in San Francisco lives near sort of a community garden. But the community gardens, uh, until they start displacing a lot of the homes there, they start tearing down homes to uh, create uh, arable land, um, they're not producing enough food for a whole city. So the cities are very, they're dead ducks, really, as far as the uh, food chain is concerned. Uh, one other point, uh, you mentioned shipping. Um, Kunstler sees a rejuvenation of a lot of American cities that were there in the first place because they had the resource of a great river, namely the, the Mississippi or the Ohio, the Missouri. Um, so because that will allow for relatively cheap transport of different things that we need, particularly what we eat, uh, cities like uh, you know St. Louis and even New Orleans, port cities, uh, will enjoy a comeback. Right. I live uh, in, uh, I think, the second biggest port in North America is Vancouver and the surrounding area. So being having close access to the ocean or uh, rivers, very important then to our future survival. Yeah, it's good. It's good. And I, I remember there was a symposium that was, I, I think, reported on in the New Yorker. This could have been 20, 25 years ago. But uh, one, of the, one of the winners was a Russian. The, the idea was to be self-sufficient in as energy-efficient way as possible. And uh, I think uh, there was one Russian already doing this, uh, a guy who apparently... <laughs> it's like he remembered the the, uh, the siege of Stalingrad or something, but um, uh, he he was growing apples. He had an orchard, and his uh, his supply line was really the uh, I can't remember whether it was the uh, oh, maybe the Erie or or one of the uh, the, the tributaries or the, the streams coming from Great Lakes. So. Um, uh, anyway, he, uh, his transport, he was growing apples and, and bringing them to market by, uh, it wasn't even a, it wasn't even, it was a sail powered boat. So that's about as efficient as you get. Of course, uh, now Greta Thunberg, uh, the, the young environmentalist with her famous trip across the ocean in, in a sailing yacht. So of course it's a multi-million dollar carbon fiber craft. And apparently the crew for it had to be uh, flown all across the planet so that there were people to actually uh, take it. So, yes, her personal trip may have had a very low carbon footprint, but once you add all the support staff and satellites and so on, it was a very expensive, energy-intense one. So sometimes what appears to be the right thing may be the very wrong thing to do. Is that something uh -huh. we have to be careful of? Well, we're not even, we're not cognizant of it really. There's a very funny video out there right now of that little brat, uh, Greta Thunberg. She's in high dudgeon or low dudgeon, I guess I should say, with just an amazing rant. She's, she's not even in tears. There's, there's, uh, you, you wouldn't let her near your pet if you saw the expression in her face as she was ranting about, you know, we've, we can't keep depleting energy and, and, uh, and we, we can't keep polluting the earth and, and filling the atmosphere f with carbon dioxide. So some some guy, I, I think it was an Australian uh, a guy who's got a show in Australia, and he just took it apart. He basically was uh, listed out all the things that Greta Thunberg in her life uses that are, uh, she's using uh, computers to communicate and digital devices, and, and she's got all the creature comforts of uh, Sweden or wherever the heck she's from. And um, her life is hardly uh, hardly a a model of uh, of energy uh, frugality. Well, yes, you you take a look at uh, most likely she's wearing uh, artificially produced clothing. Uh, probably not all natural fibers, and if they are, how did the feed for those animals get to the farm? And then after you've harvested the animal, how did it get back to you? Uh, all, all that takes tremendous amounts of energy. The mayor of Vancouver is against oil and gas exploration. 
And uh, again, as usual, they, they don't want to be interviewed about it. But I would just say uh, that computer on your desk, how much plastic and metal is in that? Well, without oil and gas exploration, uh, the case for the computer wouldn't have been made. You wouldn't have found uh, the metals that are in it, the rare earths and so on. So take that away. Are you wearing synthetic material? Yes, take that off. Uh, that wood for your desk, you use chainsaws, you use gasoline for power. So get rid of that. Well, you know, you're going to have a naked man standing in an empty office if you take away our energy resources right now. Right, and and none of the none of our Hollywood stars will be able to get to to uh, to Switzerland anymore for the you know for the energy conference. And uh, we're just, I guess, there's a lot of hypocrisy there. But when you take away the energy inputs, all these things that we can we have to eliminate in order to save energy, we're not left with much. Hmm. And yes, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in his super yacht, followed by another super yacht stocked with supermodels. I'm sure that's <laughs> that's uh, super energy efficient as well. Right, he's caught a lot of flack for that. I'm not quite sure how, how he's getting around anymore, but but it's probably not a rickshaw. <clears throat> yeah, also, I mean, the Alberta oil sands are always pointed to as, oh, that's just the worst example of energy production on Earth. They do a lot of carbon capture, and they produce uh, as much pollution altogether as something like three coal-powered uh, power plants in Wisconsin. That's uh-huh, it. That's right. that's their carbon footprint. And so every major U.S. city's probably got some big power plant somewhere using coal still. And China plans to build 200 more coal-fired plants. And and yet they have people ranting against natural gas here. It's a fossil fuel. Well, if you stop all the methane leaks as it's being shipped, unlike what Russia doesn't do, apparently they just let the methane leak all over the place because satellites pick it up. Again, in North America, we're pretty environmentally conscious here because votes count. And if you pollute somebody's uh, local stream or river, the politicians pay the price. Uh huh. Yeah, I think I think everybody by now has seen a lot of the the stats the re, uh, regarding the construction of and the eventual dismantling of wind generators. These these towers and the blades are enormous. And for a while, the focus was on how it was killing bird populations, but but um, there are some other negatives there including all uh, tucker carlson has something a series about how uh the wind generators are in places where the people who want them uh to be everywhere uh they're, they're least exposed to them they're not putting them in those people's backyards or out off cape cod uh marring the scenic splendor of the cape but uh it takes a lot it takes a lot of energy to build a, a wind generator and, of course, they don't last forever, so you have to think about the cost of dismantling them eventually. Now, th- there are other ways that are friendlier. In Paris, their streetlights are powered by, uh, it looks like a tree from the distance, but when you get up close, the leaves are actually little wind turbines uh, placed randomly, and they can be bright colors, so they look like it's a tree in, in the fall. And, and so there... You don't have to worry about something that looks ugly. And and again, in North America, we seem to have the attitude that if you build a factory, it has to look ugly. You know, uh, form and function, that's a Victorian idea. In Spain, when they build a factory, you can make it look beautiful, part of a mountainside. And did it cost any more to make it look like that? Probably not. You're using the same uh-huh. materials. You just have an artist or an architect who has some vision rather than somebody who's still building just uh, big concrete blocks. Uh, should I point out we're not really building factories anymore? I know, not here. Uh, <laughs> nope, nobody wants to dirty their hands making actual things. Of course, yeah. the big money, the one that supports not the uh, the global GDP of two, $260 trillion or whatever it is, but the, 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 the productivity that supports... The two-plus quadrillion-dollar derivatives market, that's where all the money's made. So people aren't building factories, and and uh, you, you never have to worry about ugly ones because uh, that's not the business of this planet anymore. It's shuffling paper. Mm-hmm. We'll have more with Rick Ackerman right after this. Don't miss out. 
Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. Uh, Rick, what's your opinion on Bitcoin right now? Same as it's been. Uh, I think uh, I have a target. It's currently around 60,000, uh, trading a little below 60. Uh, but I think it's going to 89,000 plus. Let's call it an even 90,000. And that'll be, well, that's, I think that could be a very important top for Bitcoin. Uh, that said, um, there's nothing behind Bitcoin. There's no reason. No, no one has given me a reason yet why it should have any value at all. The only thing that is uh, adduced uh, in, in, in that way is that is its scarcity. You know, Satoshi uh, essentially allowed for 21 million bitcoins. As we get closer to the threshold, uh, we seem to reach a finite limit. But uh, there's an infinite number of possible cryptocurrencies that are in the Bitcoin family. And so um, it's it's the last thing in the world you want to hold as a store of value or as a hedge against the worst times. And, um, you know, relating to what we were talking about earlier about energy, you couldn't ask for a more energy-intensive waste than the creation, the so-called mining of Bitcoin. Now, again, Bitcoin, very energy-intensive China banning trade in Bitcoin because of the energy use, yet countries like Canada and the U.S. that, well, right now are still pretty uh, energy self-reliant, are are they the future of Bitcoin? I know in Alberta they set up Bitcoin farming sites but didn't get uh, permitting uh, permission from the, the government or from the locals who complained that it sounded like uh, an aircraft about to take off because of the noise generated by these Bitcoin farming plants. Well, the, the flavor of the week story concerning China and Bitcoin, this is only hours old, is that China is now really uh, taking a closer look at Bitcoin and it's about to unban it. So that's, that's, I don't know whether that's the, the news media sort of uh, navel gazing there or not. But, uh, yeah, China's about to take another hard look at Bitcoin. But I think ultimately the Chinese have shown that they're not really keen on having capital go into things that are intrinsically wasteful. The, the, the blockchain uh, technology is not wasteful at all. I think it's got a great future, uh, just not in the creation of money. What's going to happen with uh, crude and natural gas? Well, the good news is that it's going the price is going to crash. Um, you know, we're going to be in a global depression. So to the extent that current prices are way out of whack with demand to begin with, uh, they'll be even more out of whack when the global economy is on its back. Uh, just, I should mention though, that, um, my own forecast calls for, I think it was a uh, hundred five bucks on the uh, December crude. And I've got a guy in my chat room who's, uh, he, he's got his own system and he sees a, a, a fleeting spike in crude up to, I think it was in the $150, $160 range. So that wouldn't last long. This, this, the, the global economy wouldn't survive a week of $150 oil prices. So, uh, but I do see a crash in oil prices coming off some, some high above where we are now. Rick, so overall, uh, should you be preparing for disaster or still uh, trading short term to try to keep taking advantage of what looks to be a continually rising market? Well, um, I, I don't know about how many people are equipped out there to, to short to trade short term. I do it with a couple of partners, and we're in and out of things. We're we're kind of looking at some of these uh, index futures, the, the E-mini NASDAQ this morning, to figure out a way to get short them. But um, but it, it's not a trade, really. I think you have to get your house in order uh, to prepare for some very hard times. So uh, unless you are a professional trader, uh, I would stay away from whatever opportunities are represented by this this volatile topping topping process that I believe we're in now. Rick, thank you so much for chatting with us. Uh, a pleasure, Jim. I appreciate your inviting me on. 
My guest has been Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks. His website, rickackerman.com. If you have any questions for Rick or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.